In the second section on uh, spatial information aggregation, we'll be looking into two different uh, methods called weights of evidence and probability aggregation. Uh, there are uh, quite a number of applications of weights of evidence methods. Um, there's uh, quite a substantial literature, uh, and so there's a lot of experience with these methods, both in, uh, in uh, say, potential mapping for minerals, but also in, in land size susceptibility map. Uh, so some of the original application in geosciences goes back to Bonham Carter, 1988. Uh, and there's also a nice uh, teaching aid by Helmut Schaben in 2012 that uh, that sort of looks at, at sort of a, a more global view on how all these methods link together. So um, I will give a very br brief uh, recall on probability theory. I'm assuming many of you are, are familiar with that. Um, <clears throat> So uh, typically, as you know, we are looking at uh, defining events or at least defining some kind of uh, universe of things that can happen. And uh, these are events A. Um, we also will be dealing with what's called the complement of the event. That means the event A is not happening. So everything else but A. Um, so that's what's written uh, here, that the complement of A is simply everything uh, of A except for the whole universe except for A. So um, the probability can be seen as a measure. Um, I'll come back to that um, in a bit um, because it uh, it will actually, if you understand the notion of measure, it will allow us to understand why in the later sections we will be dealing with odd ratios and log ratios again, just like we did with compositional uh, data. What's uh, more important uh, to us is conditional probability because uh, we'll have some evidence, say evidence B, and we'd like to use that evidence to inform or to uh, reduce uncertainty on some kind of hypothesis A. And so here's just a notation and a classical definition of the conditional probability as uh, expressed by the joint probability. A conditional probability can also just be seen as a probability, except that now uh, it's a probability measure on subset of the universe, uh, namely on that side of the subset of the universe where A has been observed. And so, therefore, if you write what the classical P of A given B, uh, let me put on my pointer, if you look at the a classical P of A given B, then we can also simply write as P, P of B A. And so then if we look at the Kolmogorov system, uh, total probability is one, the mutually exclusive events is the sum of those probabilities uh, still apply. So let's uh, also look at the complement. Um, so we can also write uh, the same um, rule as for uh, as for the complement. Uh, so we'd be the joint probability of A and the complement of B over the marginal of uh, the complement of B. So if we then look at uh, Bayes' rule, so that would be this, and then also apply Bayes' rule to the complement, and we take the ratio of those two, and that would be done here at the bottom, then we notice that that's equal to the ratio of the prior and the ratio of the likelihoods. Um, so uh, likelihood is typically uh, called P of B given A, P of A given B is typically called posterior. So what's important here um, to notice is that this ratio is independent of P of B, and that's going to be important. Um, so it always suggests that it's easier to go and model ratios rather than uh, model um, the, the directly the conditional probabilities uh, because that would uh, require or require knowing P of P. The notion of total probability, um, if you have uh, um, an event B, uh, so what it basically um, does here is that if you have P of A given B, then you can um, what is called marginalize that uh, by removing uh, the influence of B by taking this product. Uh, and then what you essentially have is that this product uh, becomes a, a the marginal uh, distribution simply because uh, you're integrating over, say, the universe uh, of all events, as long as, of course, then also the B uh, I and the, uh, the BIs are, are mutually exclusive. So this brings us then to the well-known Bayes formula. Uh, 
uh, where now uh, we have the bottom part here is written as the total probability or probability of B. So nomenclature is prior probability, posterior probability, and likelihood uh, probability. Here we have just a generalization of uh, Bayes' formula. It's basically extending the conditioning part. So instead of having one event, we have now uh, two uh, events or two variables. And so instead of having uh, just one, we have two, and we can just write the joint probability as before. Similarly, if we do the ratio, that means we take the, uh, the probability of A and its complement, uh, then again, we notice that this part is not a function of this probability, which is again makes it easier because we don't have to somehow calculate this term or have to model that term or calculate some kind of the total probability. Independence of events. So a stochastic independence simply means that you can write the joint distribution as a product of the marginal uh, distribution. So if two events are independent, then also uh, any combinations of the complements uh, are independent. A much more challenging concept uh, is that of conditional independence. Conditional dependence is not as strong as independence. Um, what we uh, do in conditional dependence, or the property here, is that if two, we have now a third component. So imagine we have a B1, B2, and now we have also some evidence A. Um, and we'd like to know the probability of both B1 and B2 given evidence A. Conditional independence essentially means that under the assumption we know A, so we now have a condition, then the, uh, the joint probability of B1 and B2 can be written as two marginal probabilities now also conditioned to A. So this notion of conditional independence obviously depends on what A is. So if A changes, then all suddenly uh, two things may no longer be conditional independent. It's also equivalent to saying that uh, probability of B1 given A and B is simply independent now. Given I know A, I don't need to have B2 to uh, m uh, model uncertainty on B1, so, so that then drops out of the equation. So that's more of the classical um, Markov type um, dependency example that you can give of in order for me to predict the weather, I didn't, don't need to know the weather yesterday, the weather today is just sufficient. That doesn't mean that the weather yesterday is independent of the weather tomorrow. Actually, they're probably very dependent. It's just that uh, the strong knowledge of A provided by A makes them um, both independent. So this all seems a little technical, uh, but it has uh, tremendous consequences in terms of uh, modeling. Uh, simply because the the idea of conditional or the notion of conditional independence uh, will be very useful in simplifying the problem. But at the same time, we have to be very uh, careful with making such assumption, simply because making the wrong assumption or making assumptions where things are in fact conditionally dependent will lead to erroneous results in terms of posterior probabilities. Just to give you an idea that we can't just make broadside uh, 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 statements of a conditional independence, we have to worry about what the notion of B here is. So imagine you have two areas, area one, uh, area two, and we have some information which is called geophysics. Uh, the event A1 means that area one has uh, geothermal potential, uh, A2 means area two has geothermal potential, and B means uh, geophysics is favorable. So conditional independence would mean that, um, that you still don't, if you, for example, now knew that A2 occurs, uh, that doesn't mean you know anything more about A1 at this particular point, simply because the geophysics is, um, and certainly in geothermal, may just be one of the many, many factors that are involved. So knowing this geophysics still doesn't tell us anything about whether if we know A2, what do we know about A1? So we could say those two probabilities can be modeled as independent. The situation changes, however, if you uh, increase a B in terms of it, the information cares. Uh, imagine that B now contains many, many factors, including the fact that, for example, area one and area two close by, their geophysics is favorable, tectonics are favorable, maybe have a similar tectonic setting, uh, heat is favorable, and uh, the structural setting that in that area is very favorable as well. So then, of course, knowing B, we can no longer say that if I know A1, then I know nothing about A2. In fact, 
the fact that A1, say, has considerable potential will then also mean uh, that A2 has considerable uh, potential. So in that case, we cannot assume conditional independence. So again, what's really important is not to have sort of uh, sweeping statements about conditional independence, but really look very carefully at what it is that you're conditioning on. And potentially, you can also then have some physical reasoning um, that has to do with, uh, with that, uh, in particular, whether the information is very informative or, or just not very informative. So as a consequence that um, even if B1 and B2 are conditional independent under A, that doesn't mean that B1 and B2 are conditional independent under the complement of A. Um, and uh, however, if we assume they're both conditional independent under A and under the complement of A, then again, we can start writing ratios and simplifying those ratios. Because under conditional independence, we have that uh, the joint probability is simply the product of the marginal probabilities condition to A, uh, we can now take a ratio of probability of A given uh, over the probability of A, the complement of A condition to the same uh, to uh, events, and we find that it nicely writes out as this ratio. So this is the ratio of the marginals, the ratio of the conditioning on A for B1 and the conditioning on A for B2 and that for the complement as well. So again, you could see that this is going to be uh, useful later on. Uh, it allows us to, even if you imagine you have more than B1, B2, you have B3, B4, F, etc., then all these become essentially ratios. Here's an example of, um, it's a simple calculation example to show this idea of conditional independence when that holds and when it doesn't hold. So we have here uh, three colors, uh, red, uh, blue, and yellow. And so um, uh, they overlap with each other. We notice that this is yellow and here we get an overlap between uh, blue and red, which gives the purple color. So if we first look at conditioning to that uh, yellow square. So that would be A in this particular case, let's say. So given that, uh, what is the probability of having red and uh, blue? Well, that's very simple. Uh, if you count simply, you have 12 squares here. And so two of those squares are both in A and uh, are both in red and green. So the total is one over six. Similarly, we can, we can calculate um, are you given G and B given G by counting, and we find that one is one third or four over 12, the other is six over 12, that's all this amount here. Four over 12 is this amount here. We get a half, a third, multiply, we get one sixth. So, however, if we now take the complement of the yellow, that means everything that's not a yellow square, then this no longer holds. Uh, and now you can do a simple counting and calculation for that, and you'll find that indeed the conditional dependence no longer holds. So again, it's very important to to be careful with making such assumptions. Okay, so now we turn to um, odds. Uh, you have noticed uh, in previous slides that we've uh, looked at all the ratios, and particularly ratios of A and the complement of A. And so a ratio of that is called the odds. Uh, for example, if the probability of A is uh, zero, then the odds are basically zero, and the odds will increase as the probability of A increases. So an odd is basically uh, a number that's between zero and infinity. If once we know the odds, we know also the probability. We can also write conditional odds uh, by looking at conditional probabilities. So why work with odds um, or ratios? Um, well, that's been shown before, then um, some of the calculations uh, become uh, much easier. And so we're also not dealing with this issue that um, probability is between zero and one. So now we have something that's between zero and uh, infinity. The problem, however, working with odds is actually shown on the left-hand uh, picture here. We notice these are the odds and these are the probabilities. And we notice that odds and probabilities are very much sort of similar until getting close to one and everything has to go to infinity. Uh, so one way of dealing with that is log ratios. Uh, so this is very, reminds you probably of uh, the compositional data analysis. And in a way, a probability is a composition because it's a measure on events and those ev the probability, those measure on those events has to sum up to 100%. So there's a closed sum just like you would have in a closed sum of a chemical composition. 
So it makes a lot of sense to work with log of odds, and these are called also logits. And if you indeed do that, then uh, you get this really nice uh, function that's a whole but much better behaved than, than this particular function. So this refers to this function here. If you invert it, um, then you get what is called the logistic function, which is a typical sigmoidal function that's known in computer science. And the function that we also be using uh, in the next section on uh, a session on logistic uh, regression. Okay, so now we come to the first method, which is a method of weights of evidence. So the idea here is the same as we see in the, in the examples, is that we have um, some target feature we'd like to determine, and we may have already observed this in certain areas of, of the domain, such as a mineralization occurred, a geothermal system occurred, etc., and we have multiple evidences. So how do we combine these multiple evidence and tell us something about the uncertainty of such occurrence in other areas? Uh, so and that's something that um, uh, provides us a map and, uh, of either susceptibility or probability. So um, just a, a, an, another small example. That's the one I mentioned, uh, one of the papers in the introduction. It's a landslide example. Uh, in, in Colorado, and it's a really nice paper because it explains the idea of, um, of, of uh, weights of evidence uh, very neatly and very educationally. As we showed in the first session, um, the way this will work is that we'll determine uh, a number of factors um, that have influence on landslide, whether geological land cover, topography, etc. And then we'll use those factors, create maps, and um, also have some landslide inventory uh, that allows us to then compare that with these geological factors. So the method of weights of evidence, and that's something I want to emphasize over and over, it's a pure frequentist method. So there will be no modeling. Uh, so all the probabilities we'll calculate are not done through any modeling, meaning fitting uh, probabilistic models, but are just done by counting. Uh, what that however means is of course is that if you have uh, continuous variables you have to discretize them uh, for example distance to fault would be one such variable um, where you can discretize uh, those uh, distance to fault in discrete classes and of course this will all have some kind of influence on, on, on the result the other thing that of course we need to have is sufficient amount of landslide pixels um, for landslides this is probably not such a great problem but for mineralizations uh, this may be uh, a serious problem if we have, don't have sufficient amount of observations of actual mineralization, then it's very difficult to apply weight of evidence methods. So we'll uh, start with the binary case, uh, similarly mean absence of presence of a factor, absence of presence of a landslide. So if you, if you just have one factor, uh, then this sort of picture as it conceptualizes the whole idea is that we have an area where we have presence of a factor and then outside that area, let's say we have absence of a factor. And then we notice that uh, we have presence of landslide. Uh, and then of course, we also have a lot of absence uh, uh, of landslide, both inside and outside the factor. So we can also uh, visualize it a little bit with the Venn diagram. Uh, where you're looking at uh, a landslide and a factor. Um, and, um, and so here you look at the intersection. So if you have two factors, then it gets a little bit more complicated, of course. And uh, what's also important to, to look at is, is was of course, is if there are no landslide and not a factor. So we're going to look a lot at the complement as well. And that will have to do with whether something has a, a weight of evidence for it presence of a, of a landslide or whether there is some evidence against presence of a landslide, so the absence of a landslide. As I mentioned before, everything is going to be, this is the same picture essentially, uh, and the way it's going to happen uh, is that um, we'll have to discretize everything. Uh, and so we'll look at a total area of study, the number of pixels, uh, 340 of those, let's say this here, are covered by the causative factors, 110 are covered by the area of landslide, and then you have 70 of those are covered by both. 
let's first uh, take a simple approach of a, a single problem of a single binary evidence and a single occurrence. So we call D uh, equal one that the feature, the mineralization say occurs, and D is that the mineralization is absent. Uh, BS1 means that, uh, that there evidence of, of some feature occurs and that the evidence of feature is not absent. So that's the, the F basically in the previous slides. So recall also that uh, we'd like to work with ratios. Uh, so we'll uh, calculate the ratio of the probability of D uh, given um, that B is one, put my pointer here, uh, and also the complement, uh, which is uh, the opposite. So this, we write that simply as these ratios, which is the marginal of D and then this conditional probability. So now we write that in terms of odds. Uh, so we notice that this is the odd of D and this is uh, this relationship here. We call that also sufficiency or S. Okay, so this is what we had on the previous slide. So now it makes a lot of sense to take a logarithm of all this. Uh, so logarithm of an odd becomes a logit. Uh, we examine the logarithm of this plus the logarithm of that. So what we have here now is that the logarithm of this is this guy plus this here. And this is essentially what we call uh, the, the, that there is a weight in favorable. So if, if this would be uh, larger than this one, then we have a favorability to having uh, a relationship between the two rather than between uh, that and its complement. So this is the weight of favorable evidence. So conversely, we can also look at uh, the feature not occurring and to what extent that our factor is, say, informing us of the absence rather than the presence of uh, and potential. And then we just write the same thing as before, but now we work on B complement uh, instead of B as was done before. And so what we then get is W negative, which means uh, that there is negative evidence, there is an absence uh, issue here, and that is also called N or the necessity. So Typically, what is also reported in a weights of evidence models is what's called a contrast, which is the difference between evidence for the presence and evidence for the absence. So the bigger this is, uh, the more contrast, the more discriminating uh, the evidence is. Uh, contrast is actually log of S divided by N, and S divided by N, and I remember, is this odd ratio here. Once we have weights of evidences, uh, then we can also calculate uh, probabilities. For example, I can calculate this probability uh, and that would simply be using the, uh, the logistic function. Of course, in reality, we don't have a single evidence, but we have to deal with multiple evidences. So the problem uh, then, of course, is that uh, we have to uh, condition on a large series uh, of um, factors, which is uh, shown over here. So uh, if you apply Bayes' rule, then this leads to writing it like this, but then we still have this. Uh, this problem here. Now, the only way to get rid of this problem is to assume conditional independence. Uh, now, notice that we're making quite a sweeping statement here is that regardless of all these B's and M's and D, I can write this conditional independence assumption. So this need not be true. And we'll see later that this needs to be somewhat verified or it's very difficult to verify though. Uh, so if that's true, then we can write it, uh, these things as products uh, and that will make life a lot easier. Indeed, if we do that, uh, then we end up with um, this equation, this equation, we make the ratio of the two. That's what we have done before. And then we get what we have shown before is that these are product of the marginals of D. And this is simply the product of all the conditions of, of all the evidences. So that product consists of M terms, the amount of evidence available. So then I can write uh, one as an odd ratio of D given the evidence an odd ratio uh, as d given the complement of the evidence which is in the prior uh, times the product of of these sufficient conditions sufficiencies and the product of these necessities equally we then we can write a uh, contrast for each one right the contrast is a simply uh, this ratio and it can compute now, uh, 
W pluses and W minus for each of the evidence. So this is evidence towards presence, evidence towards absence, and the difference between the two is the contrast. So what that then all leads uh, down to eventually is that we can write the logit uh, as before, and now we instead of having a single a W plus, we have a sum of W uh, plus L. And so this summing is just a direct consequence of the assumption of conditional independence. We can also evaluate any other logic uh, dependent on any other choices of presence or absence of the evidence, uh, and that would then be written uh, in the same fashion as before. We can also calculate any type of conditional probability expression simply by using the log logistic function. As I mentioned before, any kind of a practical calculation uh, for rates of evidence will just involve counting. There's no modeling. And so we're just actually just uh, trying to figure out what are these conditional distributions uh, that we have. For example, distribution on the left would be the probability of having the factor given the landslide. So this is simply has related to the number of pixels where landslides are present with a given class divided by that and this number n2 where they are not present. And so that is simply now this probability. And so we can calculate the same for the other probabilities. There will just be different uh, numbers we need to calculate. So this is very simple, right? It's uh, simply counting. So if you then apply that, uh, then to our case, then we get something like this. Uh, we, have, we have now an additional rows, uh, column, sorry, where this is uh, weights towards the uh, the evidence towards its absence, evidence of the presence. Absence is quite unclear here. Uh, and then um, uh, the difference, which is the contrast. And so we notice, for example, uh, that some of these uh, indeed have a large contrast uh, as well here. All right, let's now turn to the assumptions made in uh, rates of evidence, since we mentioned before, is the issue of conditional independence. The issue, uh, it's very difficult to test uh, when you have multiple evidences. And so uh, the question is, um, how do we uh, go forward and test that assumption? The other thing, of course, is that all probabilities are, are, are based on counts, and so um, so that makes it often difficult in cases where uh, we need to do when, when we have insufficient data and some modeling actually could be quite useful. So let's uh, see how we can develop a test for conditional independence. The problem with the test is that uh, we can we will not be able to do a full test of conditional independence. Uh, so imagine here this equation is just for two, but imagine you have this for for uh, say 30 evidence layers then obviously if you were able to test for conditional independence then you can as well uh, write down this conditional joint probability so the way it uh, can be done is is to do some necessary testing so this is a not sufficient test but a necessary test is by doing pairwise comparisons so instead of looking at all the factors together we're going to look, uh, look at them uh, um, two at a time and in that case we could possibly derive uh, some of these uh, joint distributions uh, here, I put my pointer, some of these joint distribution here, uh, and compare it with what it would look like if we assumed uh, conditional 
uh, independence. So these um, comparisons uh, are then made by assuming conditional independence and then trying to uh, state a hypothesis and try to reject it. Uh, so what we, the way we reject it then, of course, is that we need to de develop a criterion by which we can do such rejection. So here is uh, the way we work for this pairwise comparison. So if you do a pairwise comparison, uh, here are a number of factors involved in the um, in the prediction of landslides. If you would uh, do that, we get a uh, of course a table. Uh, and so what we'd like to look at is is what's the value in such table between any two factors. So what is this value in this table? Well, if we had two factors, two a binary pattern, binary pattern, we have a presence and absence, and we can look at any of these conditional distributions, uh, whether they are based without the conditional independence hypothesis and the conditional independence hypothesis. And so then we can compare them in the classical way we would do if we have if we compare uh, essentially uh, two distributions. Uh, here is just a simple binary uh, case. So the degrees of freedom of the chi-squared is essentially one. So we calculate this number here, but obviously if this number is large, then I'm deviating from my hypothesis. And so we see indeed that uh, for some of these uh, factors, there's a substantial uh, conditional uh, independence. And so for, for those, uh, we have to be very careful in interpreting the weights uh, and in calculating essentially the conditional uh, probability finally, because it's essentially the con it's the conditional probability, uh, the final posterior probability that will be uh, affected by um, the assumption of conditional independence. Weights of evidence uh, work on frequencies. Uh, that also means that any kind of um, information needs to be provided as such. And so we calculate conditional distributions just by time. The problem, however, is that in some circumstances, evidence is expressed as beliefs and is not expressed by counting. And so uh, this is typically when we deal with experts. So expert one says, uh, I believe, you know, in a scale of one to 10 uh, or zero to 10, I believe with um, a score of seven that this event will occur based on my uh, prior experience. So this belief is, is essentially dependent on the expert, dependent on the experience uh, of the experts and how the expert looks at evidence and draws conclusion about some unknown event. So here's a simple example problem of that. Uh, suppose two persons, uh, call them B1 and B2, express their belief about it raining tomorrow. And suppose that is significant. So person one believes uh, that the probability is 0 0.7. Uh, suppose this person one is a uh, meteorologist. Uh, person B uh, states that their belief is uh, 0 0.6, suppose this is an atmospheric scientist. And so historically, we know that, uh, and this will be the counting, historically, this uh, we know that it raining tomorrow is 0.25%. And so, of course, we know that these two persons got their information in different ways. Otherwise, their probability should be equal. And if they're not equal in that case, then there's just simply inconsistencies. So we don't uh, rely, we don't uh, deal here with the notion of inconsistency. We just deal here with the notion that two persons express different beliefs uh, based on their own, based on evidence provided to them, which could be, say, the uh, the conditions of uh, of uh, pressure and temperature today, and based on that, in their experience, maybe other models, uh, different models, they express different beliefs. So the question now is, what is the probability that it will rain tomorrow? Is it lower than 0 0.6, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, or higher than 0 0.7? One may be tempted, of course, to do averaging. Uh, averaging would then also ignore the prior uh, distribution. Uh, what is shown here is that, at least compared with history, we notice that two persons uh, state um, belief towards the evidence, indeed, that there it will rain tomorrow. So uh, in that sense, we have to include this prior distribution into our, into our calculations. The second thing we have to account for is what is the, uh, the overlap in, uh, in, in, in that belief between these uh, two persons. So if these two persons have similar backgrounds and it's very likely they express similar belief and so that the information that is provided by them uh, is somewhat uh, independent. So um, this is a, a very classical problem. Uh, there are many solutions to that. Uh, one of the solutions we'll look at today is, is provided by Journal in this paper here below. Uh, on combining knowledge of diverse sources, and also there is an application uh, 
uh, there an application the subsurface or uncertainty quantification subsurface uh, in this leading edge publication. In the previous slide, I mentioned the notion of redundancy. Um, redundancy is uh, different from dependency. So redundancy measures the degree of, of, as I said, intersection of the two intersources with regard to how much information they provide with some target. So in redundancy, we're looking at at least three things at the same time, which is different from dependency, which is association, which is saying what is the overlap, what is the, uh, the correlation, let's say, between B1 and B2, regardless of what we'd like to know uh, about A. So redundancy is difficult to measure uh, because um, if you have many, um, it's, it's easy to measure if you have only two data sources, as we saw in the previous uh, context of weights of evidence, there may be ways of, of counting uh, distributions. Uh, however, if we have many evidences, then we run into the same problem of um, having a very large uh, joint uh, distribution that needs to be conditioned on, on, the, uh, on the information. So again, we'll need to deal with uh, some kind of assumption or at least have some kind of assumption uh, that simplifies the whole problem. So again, we return to the conditional independence hypothesis, but it's a somewhat differently formulated. So it's no longer, we'll see that it's no longer formulated directly on probabilities, but it's formulated on ratios. Uh, so we return to the notion of ratios. So the conditional independence hypothesis um, that we will state, and this will clarify that in a bit, is that the relative contribution of some information source or some belief uh, expressed by B2 to knowledge A is the same whether or not you have information B1. So um, essentially B2 will not change their minds uh, knowing uh, what B1 is, and that's perhaps also a good thing. Um, so it's different here that this is no longer expressed with conditional distribution, but it seems like it's expressed with some relative contribution. So relative uh, then again refers to ratios. So the ratios we write here is slightly different, you know, odd ratios. Uh, there's just the reverse of this one over the odd ratios. Uh, so we write down uh, this uh, B1 here is simply this probability. So now this is no longer, um, oh, sorry, I didn't put on my pointer. So this is no longer uh, expressed here as uh, as the odd, but um, sorry, this is no longer expressed by counting, but is expressed essentially by these beliefs. This uh, quantifies uh, then for B B two. Um, then we also have the prior. This is uh, this is going to be important, and then it is uh, what we would like to know is x. So again, just like in the odds, once I know odds, I can calculate probabilities just by uh, reversing this equation. Okay, let's now again look at this hypothesis uh, and what it would mean uh, mathematically. So let's first look at the relative contribution of B2 to knowing A. So um, that has nothing to do with B1. So there's no B1 essentially available. So it's relative to what we already know, which is the prior distribution. So now because I work with ratios, um, I can write this as uh, basically as differences. Remember that we can just subtract uh, probabilities uh, that may become problematic. So what I can uh, subtract are these kind of ratios. And so this would be a relative. So it's relative B2 minus A uh, over A would be uh, expressing that the first term. So now we include B1. So including B1, may looking at uh, basically both information, but then minus uh, minus uh, this uh, information B1. So now we have already be information B1, and so we, we, we express everything relative to information B1. And so what this says is that this is the same. This is equal to each other. So if that's the case, uh, then now finally I can uh, work out what X is, uh, and once I have X, I can calculate um, the, uh, the conditional, the joint and conditional distribution, and that comes out simply in this uh, simple equation. So, okay, let's return to our problem. Uh, if we use that equation, and you can figure it out uh, quickly, is that we find now that this number is 0 0.91. So why is it higher than 0 0.7? Well, if B1 and B2 are soon to be somewhat independent, at least uh, in terms of predicting A, then uh, what has been provided to us is two beliefs that are higher than the historical rate. 
So if we would combine those two informations, we expect that, that indeed we would have more uncertainty, uh, less uncertainty than if we would have a single source would be 0 0.7. So you can imagine if I have a single source, the uncertainty is 0 0.7. If I add a second source, it should be such, it should be uh, that if the source is somewhat independent, that the probability will become higher. And particularly when uh, the second source confirms some of the fact uh, there's a higher probability of it raining uh, than the background. Okay, so in summary, uh, for the weights of evidence, uh, we, uh, and in this case, it's better to work with odds and odd ratios instead of probabilities. In the weights of evidence, it's a frequent uh, test approach relying on conditional dependence. Uh, the previous model that I showed uh, is a belief model, but also relies on conditional independence. Conditional dependence um, is a, a, a common notion or assumption, but um, what is important is that it is also dependent on what you're conditioning on. And so when you you can't just write p of a given b, uh, give a comma b given c as this the product of p of a given c times p of a given b. It really depends on uh, what the c is essentially in that case. Uh, we um, noticed that there is uh, quite a lot of use of the logistic function, uh, and so that can uh, be generalized uh, in terms of um, logistic regression, which is what we're looking at in the next session.